I'm delighted to say it must be Tuesday because Laura Dosworth is here. How very nice to see you. Good morning. Very nice to see you. We just broke a piece of news that TikTok have been fined 12.7 million uh, for misuse of uh, data around children users of the app. So I don't know quite what the details are of that, but we'll bring them to you soon because we're going to be talking about AI and, mm. and modern technology and apps and all that sort of thing coming up a little bit later on. Um, but let's start off with a rather sad story about an elderly woman who died of hypothermia. I mean, amazing that that could happen in this day and age, um, but because of the rising price of energy. Yeah, I mean, so this is something you and I talked about a few times last year, that the um, terrifying increases in fuel costs would drive more people into fuel poverty. Yeah. Of course, charities have been warning about this, and that's why there was a scheme introduced to help homeowners. What was it? We got something like £400 a year towards our energy bills this yeah. winter. So there's an 87-year-old called Barbara Bolt, and she was found with hypothermia at home, which led to pneumonia, and she's died. And this isn't actually a very new story but of course the coronial inquest has come out which mm. links her fear of the sky-high energy bills yes. to the fact that she was she would not put her heating on she was too scared to and she's died of hypothermia, hypothermia and pneumonia and her body temperature when they found her was so low that I think that even the, the emergency workers were ringing, amazed and her family you know and, and quite often sometimes people say well what were the family doing well the family were look, doing their best to look after her. she wanted to live on her own you know they always told her she should turn the heating up but she just because of the nature of the way that she lived, she didn't do it. Well, I think that would be really unfair to turn things around on, on the family. Oh, totally, because, yeah. of course, there are thousands of people who are poor, vulnerable, you know, ill, and, need and, alone. Eating, and don't have families right. to look after them. It can't all be the family's responsibility. Also, let's not forget, there's been a massive campaign, not just in this country, but, you know, in Europe too, to get people to turn their thermostats down. Right. And sometimes the temperature they're proposing won't be safe for mm. old people with conditions. My mum has lung conditions. She needs the heating up. Yeah. She needs it up or she has to be in bed. This is true of lots of elderly people with with health conditions. Yeah. Now, this isn't... An, another way this is not a new story is it's back in 2003 when a couple were similarly found dead because they couldn't afford the heating on and David Blunkett made it um, a, a priority that mm. energy companies had to put a safety net around the vulnerable. This is not what's happened this winter. Um, you probably know Ofgem are under investigation for, uh, well, they're investigating the fact that energy companies have been putting people um, onto prepayment meters yes. if they can't pay their bills. Now, you might think this is just a handful of naughty people who aren't paying their mm. bills. It's about 10,000 people mm. a month. Wow. And what was happening was they're forcibly being put onto prepayment meters. So a case goes through the magistrate's court. The magistrate goes, yeah, OK, this person's not vulnerable. If you say they're not vulnerable... Right. And they haven't paid their bill for X amount of time. Haven't paid their bill. It's, it's not a very high threshold, I seem, I seem to remember. And yeah. then... Um, the energy company gets people to go into the home and change them from a normal meter to a prepayment meter. Mm. Don't forget that costs more. Yeah. It's harder for people on prepayment meters to get the vouchers. I think over a million of um, over a million of those vouchers giving assistance mm. with energy bills were not claimed. Right. And the fact is that a lot of those people are vulnerable and the energy companies might not have been doing enough work to make sure that people they were mm. forcibly switching onto prepayment meters weren't actually single with babies, right. unable and to pay And does it also bills, get around, because they, they introduced a new rule, didn't they, a new law that you couldn't cut people's energy supply off, which is what they used to do. I mean, I remember getting that, I think, when I was a student. You know, we lived in various different places. Sometimes there was a payment meter that you have to go down and put 50p in the, in the electric meter. Um, other times you would get cut off because you hadn't paid it. But now that you can't get cut off, but I wonder if this is a way of getting around that, because if you can't prepay, you're effectively cut off, aren't you? Well, that's exactly right. Basically, switching somebody to a prepayment meter is disconnection through the back door. Mm. And it, it is astonishing and really depressing that in this country, we're supposedly a rich country in this day and age, mm. people are dying from cold. Yeah. This it's brought, hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah, it brought a couple of things to mind for me. The first is a little bit of self-reflection. You know, we talked about energy bills a few times last year, and I said, this is frightening. Mm. People won't be able to afford their bills. There is also the risk that when you're in the media talking about these scenarios that you scare people. Mm. So according to this coronial inquest, Barbara Bolt, the 87-year-old, was frightened of her high bills. Mm. That's not necessarily anything to do with conversations you and I have, but it does make you reflect, you know, are you talking about things in the media in a way which is responsible, which won't elevate fears? Yeah. I mean, actually, 
there's a lot of fear in the media now. I'm hardly the worst perpetrator. You really it, aren't. It does make, it also, does make a lot you of think people about are yourself. A lot of people are frightened of, of their high bills because they've just got a high bill. You know, that's yeah. the reality. Yeah. One of the things that I I'm have noticed... I'm scared of my that, bills, Mike. Yeah. Bring on well, the spring. Well, even I was shocked when I got my last one. I was mm. going, blimey. You know, it's about four times higher than it used to be. But anyway, and I, I, don't, even, I don't even use that much energy. But um, one of the, 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 the things that I've noticed that's crept into modern journalism and modern media is a question that I absolutely detest hearing and I hear it a lot when people are interviewing politicians or experts in something or other and they say how worried should we be about this and it's like what sort of a question is that how worried should you be well you shouldn't be worried you should learn about the facts you should cons consult people that know about these things and you should digest it you should not sit around worrying about it yeah, but I mean, it's a I, really stupid question. I don't think it's for the government to set the emotional temperature of the nation. They, they should have as little concern with our emotions as possible. Mm. I don't even particularly like governments having well-being or happiness scores. None of it. No, don't, don't be interested, interested in my, don't be interested interested in my in fear government. anxiety. Don't con concern yourself with your, my happiness. I don't want the government anywhere near my yeah. emotions. So I hate those questions too. The other thing that this sad story made me reflect upon is about how some deaths are politically inconvenient yes. and some deaths are politically dare I say advantageous yes. so or acceptable even. there is almost there's very little very little in the media year after year but including this year about people dying from fuel poverty mm. and yet it is so avoidable now controversial and you're you're going to be surprised to hear me saying this because I'm not a big fan of state intervention yeah. but perhaps energy should be available on prescription for people who can't afford it why do we make medicines free why do we have you know food banks but we don't give energy to people who would die without it what about people who need electricity to charge up their their stair lift or breathing equipment mm. there are people who need these things if you have a brand I think new, it's a very dangerous you, road to go down well you said very but dangerous. I, I there's, a, there's a couple of angles to this there are people who cannot live without energy they cannot and should we be looking after them the second is if we looked at energy this way if we really admitted the truth of it that health is directly correlated to wealth mm. and that some people cannot live without the ability to stay warm it would halt the kind of net zero nonsense in its tracks the very idea that we're all told before winter to turn our heating down where there are some people who will die if they turn their heating down or can't run it is it's appalling it's an anathema so some deaths though are considered almost um something to trumpet about yeah. look at sadiq khan saying that four thousand people died in 2019 from poor air quality now a lot of people would hear that figure and they would take it on good faith mm. because a political well, they'd assume leader that a mayor of london wouldn't tell something which wasn't true they would they would think that and they would think the scientists they behind be the wrong. studies must be truly independent actually when you look at the research on this some of the people involved in the science inverted commas are also involved in ULE's policy mm. there is not as much independence as you would like to think between policy and governance and science yeah. now in fact 4,000 people did not die it's a statistical construct mm. in other words it's misleading yeah. what it means is that the um, your life expectancy could be affected if all cars aren't abolished yes. basically that's another way mm. of putting it and it doesn't take into account the fact that life expectancy has increased mm. that we have um, many radical wonderful health reforms it also doesn't take into account the fact that air quality and life expectancy and health are very only indirectly mm. correlated like I said the big correlation is your wealth your socio-economic level and your life expectancy yeah. if you make people poor they'll die so I find it fascinating that yeah, Sadiq Khan talking... never talks about fuel poverty. He doesn't put, no. he doesn't talk about but people dying than... of cold in no. their homes in no, London. He, doesn't. That's he talks true. about basically fictitious deaths from air quality. Mm, he does. But that's because Sadiq Khan doesn't tell the truth about an awful lot of things, but that's just his way of operating, unfortunately. But here's the thing. I was talking to um, Frank Ferrady this morning about Nigel Lawson and, and what he did as a Chancellor for this country and what he did for conservatism and what he did for the three enemies of what he called the, um, the well-run country that he made Britain at that time, which is rampant inflation uh, and over-bloated public sector um, and, and too high uh, taxes, right? Mm. And we've got all of that now. And what I would say before we start giving more free stuff away to people who can't afford things is you make it cheaper because we could have much cheaper energy if we didn't have this mad net zero um, aim that seems to have encapsulated everybody that walks the earth. You know, mm. if we fracked, if we didn't pay uh, companies surcharges uh, and, and charge people surcharges to get green energy, if green energy was actually genuinely cheaper, we'd all have it.
Mm. But we don't have that operate. We don't have that choice. If, if everything was cheaper, people wouldn't be dying. Sure. Now, don't misunderstand me. When I say should people have energy on prescription, I'm not sure what I think about that. It's a very socialist policy. I'm not sure what I think. I think there are some I mean, we already, we already the have, We already have people getting things on prescription which they could buy. But right? my point is, if we accepted that energy is a basic requirement for life, mm. it would stop some of the net zero madness in its tracks. Maybe. Which would be an that would be worth reason doing. to run the campaign. That would be worth doing. Now, what about Elon Musk? He wants to stop AI in its tracks. Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, I, I wish I understood more about the ramifications of AI. But the thing is, even Elon Musk, um, amazing tech entrepreneur, doesn't understand the ramifications. He made me laugh today. He changed the Twitter logo, by the way, from a bird to that um, dog from a, a oh, did he? digital currency. I'm just looking it at it now. I always want to say Doja, so I'm talking about the Italian Dukes of Venice, yeah. but it's doggy, I think. Oh, OK. I missed it, because I think he's changed it back. He's changed it back. Anyway, little funny funny little wink to the Twitterverse yes. today. Um, yes, he has said that AI, while it has potential for enormous benefit for humanity, it's also potentially really dangerous. It's, it's something that's been on my mind for a little while, because... AI has the ability to be used for great harm to manipulate people. We live in quite a unique time mm. where there is this confluence between nudge and what we know about behavioural psychology and technology and right. what it's able to do. So actually, when, um, when my co-author Patrick Fagan and I wrote Free Your Mind, just for laughs and giggles, we decided to ask ChatGPT to write one of the chapters. Right. It was pretty good. Was it? It was. Now, it wasn't as good as our chapter. Yeah. But, it, you know, this kind of AI at the moment is like a toddler. Yeah. You know, when it's when it's been through university and done its master's and oh. its doctorate and it's writing books all on its own, let's see what it's doing then. And what it was it basing as, its chapter on? How did it write the chapter? What knowledge did you give it? We like? didn't give it any knowledge. What it does is go and find the knowledge. Okay. We, told, we told it what we wanted it to write, okay. um, which was to replicate one of the chapters we had written. Mm. It wasn't as good, like I say, but it was pretty good. Now, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine, again for laughs, asked ChatGPT to write an article in the style of Laura Dodsworth. Okay. An angry and passionate article about the dangers of AI to journalism, because it's something I've been talking about with this friend. And did, and that, did, the, did the, the AI chat I think thing it's pick on, the I subject? Think, I think for people who are watching on oh, TV, it it's, here, up, yeah. it's up on the screen right now, and I tweeted Title, it this morning. Title, The Silent Invasion, Artificial Intelligence and the Decline of Authentic Journalism. I've got to say it's a pretty good article, mm. but it made me laugh, because it's written a style in, it's written an article in my style, yeah. in, in an angry and passionate tone. It's quite florid mm. Mike it's quite florid is it? quite dramatic florid language so that's what chat GPT thinks well, of you me see because we, we funny enough Aaron uh, alerted me to this thing which I had never heard of and now it's everybody's talking about it yeah a few weeks ago maybe and I did we we asked it to write a piece about me uh, to see what it was like and it got quite a lot wrong um, like clearly made assumptions or, or went to the wrong sources for and it, you know didn't accuse me but I mean it, it said that I'd worked for places where I hadn't worked yeah. said things about me which weren't really? true yeah is that based on some kind of fake Wikipedia entry you've got something I don't put think out so. some misinformation I mean most of what's on Wikipedia is, is accurate I think um, but there's other I guess uh, there's other information about me I mean I think there's something on the internet that says I've got a net worth of about 10 million quid which is completely wrong by the way that's uh, just my ex-wife um, and you know um, I, I, it, there was quite a lot of errors in it is all I would say but you're right it's the, the very beginning isn't it so it could be and, and I was listening to Piers Morgan had a, an interview with Stephen Hawking before he died and he asked him about AI and how dangerous it was and Stephen Hawking said when AI starts to be able to make its own decisions mm -hmm. and create its own world that's when it will be dangerous. Yeah, I mean, it is actually. I would, I would contend that AI is dangerous right now. One um, essay I've asked ChatGPT to write for me before is how it will um, influence journalism. Yeah. Now, again, there's going to be positives and there's going to be negatives, but it, it is affecting journalism right now. Mm. You know, some news companies are using AI to find and write news stories. That's already are happening. They? Yeah. But also, we're a not. AI, no, here we are right no. now, real people. But um, also, AI is is algorithms. You know, and that's what algorithms are. They they are artificial intelligence, and so they create personalised digital environments. Mm. When you look at Twitter, you're not looking at the same thing as me. No. that's about who we follow and how we engage, and the kind of environment that that the algorithms create for us. But also, if you and I search for the same thing on Google, we might get different results too. Mm. And if you were say a young British person who would, meet the, who would meet the racial profiling of somebody that the government worries is 
a risk for radical terror, mm. um, a risk a risk of being radicalised, and you searched for knife crime, you would get a different result to say me. Yeah. You know, so AI um, works all on its own the way it's been programmed, and the way it can be programmed is with a lot of bias. Mm. So a future risk for journalism as well is that if AI is used, you have to remember it's it's programmed, and the people who program it will have deliberate political and ideological biases. And that's biases. really a dangerous bit, isn't it? And let's say you have to conform to some government quango um, or some voluntary form of regulation on behalf of media companies. The way AI could work is almost like a kind of a super, super injunction. Mm. It could mean that some things are just simply not discussed. Right. Imagine Well, during... they tried that, didn't they, during COVID? They tried to have things not discussed. Yeah. They tried to shut down any kind of conversation about vaccine. They tried to shut down any conversation about lockdowns. Yeah. You know, all of that happened. That's true, but it could be even worse because AI, by running it without any kind of personal human involvement, will stick to those rules yeah. potentially more rigidly. And then it gets even worse, Mike, which is that if AI is programmed to use psychology to um, persuade you um, or to control how news is disseminated, mm. again, your own environment, your own technical, technological environment is going to be um, altered in a way to manipulate your brain. You, use the example of COVID and vaccines. Well, let's just say that AI has noticed from you on social media that you're just somebody who doesn't like trying new things. Mm. Um, perhaps you're, you're what's called a, a laggard, you don't like novel things. Yeah. Well, it might use that information to specifically try and reassure you that the vaccine isn't you. Mm. So, you see, first of all, it can be programmed according to the biases of its programmers and the people yeah. that run it. Secondly, it will learn about you and adapt to you. And thirdly, it can be encouraged to use psychology to learn and adapt. Yeah. So the way that news is delivered, the way people consume it, could change beyond recognition. Journalists will be out of a job mm. unless they are. Bad ones will. Uh, well, I think it's a particular danger for news journalism. Obviously, personality-driven and opinion-led journalism is, so far as we know, here to stay. Mm. But AI is going to completely change the way we write but of course, people and would say news. that in the old days, like when I started in newspapers, for example, um, there were different biases at play and there were different news stories in the papers because they were the kind of purview of the people who ran those papers and the people who ran those papers were by and large a homogenous group of white males absolutely and there's there is a danger of thinking that everything that's happening with ai is brand new and it isn't necessarily it's just i'll different. give you i'll give you one example i thought is ai going to be a risk to my originality i like to think of myself as having quite a left mm. field creative original brain mm. what if i don't what if ai can copy me so i've been yeah, looking but it at can't though can it because it can't really copy you it can't copy your creation creativity it can copy what you've done it can't copy what you haven't done yet well can it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really generous to AI, harsh on myself and make a broader philosoph mm. philosophical point here. I like to think of myself as original, but I've taken inspiration from many sources, from things I've read, from films I've watched. I think something that AI wouldn't necessarily be able to replicate now is if I go into nature and I see a view and that itself inspires me. I could have a kind of a sensory yeah. in inspiration that it can't replicate yet. But we take our inspiration from all different kinds of sources. Well, that's what AI is doing, mm. okay? And it's accessing those sources much faster than you can. It will beat you at accessing well, sources for inspiration. But it's but it's a bit like the old argument about chess, isn't it? And whether a, a machine can be better at chess than a person. And a machine can be because it's a, it's a strictly controlled environment and the environment doesn't change really beyond what, what's possible to do on a chessboard. The world isn't like that. Life isn't like that. But and your what next is? book, you don't even know what it is. I so, do actually, so, but anyway. Well, the one after that. <laughs> That's the, true, I the don't. The point is you, you don't know how it's going to start or how it's going to end. You don't necessarily know a lot about what you're going to be doing in the next two weeks which could completely alter your life. So the chatbot could never do that. There's unpredictability. But there's another way of looking at that too, which is what is the human environment that we think is so special and original? So the famous psychoanalyst and post-World War writer Carl Jung had a great saying, which is that people don't have ideas, ideas have people. Mm. Have you ever noticed that new ideas and inventions kind of bubble up in different places in the world at the same time? There's also this elusive idea that ideas come from the collective unconscious and much less from us as individuals than we think. Mm. Who knows? There are some um, broad philosophical comparisons I there, I think. You'd have to assume that everybody is an homogenous person like the next, and they're not either. So that's the other thing, because everybody's different. And so you can't really make a... a, a you know, an AI um, bot which will replicate every single person. You'd have to make a different bot for each person, wouldn't you? 
Look, I am going kicking and screaming into this new world yeah. as much as you seem to be. I like to think I'm original, I can't be replicated. Yeah. But I think that the speed at which it's developing is very interesting and it does open up some quite broad philosophical debates, I think, which are Jungian nature about the collective unconscious. AI can find everything, everything online, everything on a server. It can access information that I can't. Maybe I'm tapped into something else, something that, you know, um, modern day psychologists would say, not necessarily say there's any evidence for, but that I personally believe, you know, our symbolism and archetypes are really hardwired. And maybe when I think I have an original idea, it's less original than I thought. I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm open-minded. Let's see what it continues to do. Maybe you just suffer from imposter syndrome. <laughs> oh, I do, I see? do. So you, 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 that could have cost you a lot of money. You could have had a seven-week series of psycho and that and then yeah, and then analytical um, exams to get to that point. And maybe I've got female socialisation. I want to talk about the difference between men and women. The, and it's specifically in relation to a horrible case in mm. the news right now. Happy Sean Scotland. Hogg, who hasn't got a custodial sentence yes. for raping a 13-year-old. And it made me think, you know, there's a country that I as a woman would not want to move to mm. now. And it's not Saudi Arabia, it's Scotland. Mm. I would really, I can't imagine a more woman-unfriendly country. They don't even know what a woman is. Right. They won't define a woman. Doesn't look like Hamza Yusuf's going to tell you either anytime soon. And, and if this rapist hasn't gone to prison, well, you know what? They're happy to put male rapists in women's prisons, mm. aren't they? They've done it. What an what a crazy situation. I, I mean, the if, idea if you're of this under 25... The case is that the guy was 17 when he committed the, the rape, right? Yeah. And they're saying that, therefore, that has to be taken into account by law, which it sort of does. I'm not defending it. Um, but it seems ludicrous that that would mean no custodial sentence at all. Well, it's extraordinary. Yeah. It's extraordinary. And and other legal, you know, legal minds have come out straight away to say it's an extraordinary act you know, not to give him a custodial sentence. What does this mean? Is this like a get out of jail free card mm. for under 25 year olds? Or was rape a special, special circumstance? Right. Is rape different? It was his first offence, but you know, if you read the details of this case, he had attacked this same girl on other occasions mm. first. Right. At 17. And surely it should be exacerbated by her age, which you, is only 13. You know what you're doing yeah. at 17. Sure. I, I mean, how can he have evaded prison mm. for this? Not only should he go to prison, he should surely go to prison for a really long mm. time. I'm not even sure that the sentence that would have been available is long enough. Imagine that 13-year-old girl and her family hearing this news. How must it feel mm. as a child to know that your male rapist attacker walked free? Yeah, and he might be walking into you around the corner because that's what a lot of the people involved in the grooming gangs said when they were you know, victims, that they would see their attackers in, in the community uh, well, every day. For the next several years, she could wonder if she's going to bump into him. It's, yeah. it's, it's just revolting. Mm. But I don't, I don't know what's going on with Scotland. No, I it's don't. a very odd place at the moment. I, I don't want to live there as a woman. I, and I live there for a long time, and my family are from there, and I find it very strange what's happening. But the only thing I can say is that an awful lot of sensible people are still in Scotland, and I talk to a lot of them, and they promise me that they're going to get it back, because they need to. They need to get it back from SNP, really, don't they? They do. Absolutely right. Laura, thank you very much indeed.